I love The Loud House. I think that it's the best cartoon currently airing on Nickelodeon at the moment. The Loud House may just be the best cartoon currently airing on Nickelodeon. It is starting to seem like Nickelodeon has been actually listening to everyone's complaints. If you truly enjoy the episodes, then in my opinion, based off of the consistency with execution, you would love many of the Loud House episodes. Nickelodeon is back with a vengeance! <laughs> you know, I'm noticing a complete lack of balls in this room. Well, it appears I'm still alive, unfortunately. Are you still alive? You are joking! Although you draw a completely different conclusion if you saw how YouTube's been treating me recently. <laughs> hey, have you ever been wrong about something? I know I have, and no, as much as it would please you so, so much, I'm not talking about my stances on Steven Universe and the Owl House, because you guys can eat shit! Yeah. Hey y'all, come look at this! Cartoon Shy's two videos were made in bad faith and more concerned with creating outrage towards the Owl House fans and stirring up Twitter drama than actually critiquing the show. <laughs> Remember guys, bad faith only applies when the criticism is mostly negative. Speaking of shows with the words the and house, I distinctly remember a certain show getting a lot of hype and praise back in 2016. I wonder how it's doing now. How can this happen to me? I made my mistake. Did I ever do the definition? Of this? Well, before we get into that mess, it's time to explain exactly why this thing was so hyped before it first aired. Ah, oh, great, it's spreading. Hey, 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 it's spreading! People come back, they go. Nickelodeon! There's no feeling quite like watching a previous force to be reckoned with in the animation scene slowly crumble to pieces over corporate greed. They're always so upfront and bubbly, those corporations. We'll take care of your creative vision, we promise. Many have tried to speak out about it, but freedom of speech just ain't welcome when it's the opposing side. People just haven't grasped that yet. No, Cartoon she. I don't see abuse of power. I see a private company. Whatever you say, pal. Maybe these private companies should do something about their rampant pedof- <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Map problem. Almost got cancelled there. It's almost like Hollywood and corporations don't have people's best interests at heart. Oh, I that is not true! Well, in any case, Nickelodeon is a corporation that's been on the decline in terms of quality. Not in money by any chance, they know what they're doing as a business and I gotta hand it to them. They do know how to swindle people into working for them. Nick is, by no small estimation, one of the best. The culture here really is fantastic. Nick has been getting a little frustrating with their treatment of other cartoons though, most of the time not giving them a single chance to walk before smothering them in broad daylight. The naive will say that Nick is incompetent, that they're doing this because they're evil and don't know how to run a good business. I see it as the exact opposite. They already have a sustainable business. Needing to experiment would just be a waste of money. Also, I don't know about you, but making sure Little Legend of Korra can't be seen on live television was secretly a favor. What did you say, nigga? <laughs> <laughs> you want me to go further? However, some misguided but optimistic people who think optimism is about denying reality because they don't like it specifically came together to praise and hype up this brand new show coming to Nickelodeon very soon. The Loud House is a Nickelodeon cartoon created by Chris Misconduct in 2016 for sex pests on DeviantArt. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. <laughs> that follows the Avengers of the Loud Family, a group of underage <laughs> children that share a close and loving familial bond with each other. Now when the show was first revealed, it initially had a lot of hype for some reason. People were mainly happy that Nickelodeon had made a cartoon that looked to rival the iconic shows they made back in the 90s and early 2000s, and in all fairness, it certainly had that vibe going for it. Interesting premise, decent theme song, and created by an industry veteran who couldn't keep it in his pants. Yeah, that sounds like classic Nickelodeon, all right. Coupled with fluid animation and a nice art style, there was certainly a lot to get excited about. If you were one of the few people in the cartoon community that cared about animation outside of the 70% that only give a shit about the next big story focus show for them to obsess over since most of them are still teenagers stuck in their fandom phase, so realistically, this show should have failed. This fucking thing sucks! So there was The Loud House, scheduled for May 2016. And then it finally aired, and, uh... 
I don't think anyone could have predicted how insanely popular the show got within its first few months of airing. Within a month, The Loud House had managed to somehow defeat Spongebob in ratings. You know, the show that killed basically all of its competition for over a decade. I'm still upset about that, by the way. And beyond the success of the show on TV, it also amassed a pretty large fandom in what appears to be a record amount of time. I've never seen a fandom for a Nickelodeon show that's as big as The Loud House, and I've never seen a fandom for a show grow quite as quickly. And they didn't even need a gay character. Yet. Not to mention all of the free press it was getting from the fucking mindless people in the cartoon community who parrot the exact same shit with no critical thinking to their fan bases. You couldn't go anywhere in the cartoon community in summer 2016 without someone saying Nickelodeon is back. The best cartoon currently airing on Nickelodeon at the moment. Nickelodeon has been actually listening to everyone's complaints. The Loud House has a bigger penis than me. All of this was parroted into people's minds by many influential YouTubers in the cartoon community and I am genuinely shocked that not enough people took a step back and said, hang on, is this one Nicktoon really going to change anything? Short answer is no, it clearly didn't. If you think one successful cartoon that starts out not being as bad as the others on the network would melt Nickelodeon's corporate heart, then you're barking up the wrong tree. It's like trying to convince your schizophrenic grandfather to actually take his pills so he can see what life is like without the cartoon sponge that dances around his deathbed. Sure, it was similar to Nick's iconic shows from the 90s, but think realistically here, people. Now, of all this hype and given what I've said so far, you've probably come to the conclusion that the show was bad and not worth anyone's time. But surprisingly, no. At least not yet. Loud House's first season was actually enjoyable for the most part. Contrary to what some people in its fandom say, the first season of the show was undoubtedly its best. It knew what it was, it had a simple but well-executed premise, it didn't fully rely on the lowest common denominator to laugh at toilet humour, and had genuinely amusing merits of its own, topped off with mostly mm. likeable characters. Shit. Don't get me wrong, it was overhyped as fuck, but the show was of a quality that I've been missing from Nickelodeon for a while. Now there were a few episodes, however, that were... <laughs> But that's a given for a Nickelodeon show anyway. The Loud House was certainly a respectable Nicktoon for its first season. However, eventually this would all come tumbling down pretty damn quickly. When the second season of the show first aired, it was clear that there were going to be quite a few problems. But while season two wasn't the worst thing I've ever seen, although at times it got pretty fucking close, it wasn't until the show's third and fourth seasons where people began to notice that something was irrefutably wrong. Can you guess what it was? I'll give you some time. Time's up. Did you guess correctly? No, we're not going there. You take me for some kind of deviant? No, as much as the unfortunate positions the show's child characters are put into, that's a problem that mainly stems from the show's fan base. <laughs> If you picked answer C, then you'd be half right. A shocking surprise, I know. In true 2010's fashion, each season managed to undo the goodwill the show had built up in its short existence and quickly turn what was once a promising return to form into Nickelodeon's next cash cow, revealing the problems with the show on the writing level and also what its mere existence and current treatment means for the future of the network. You think I'm exaggerating? They gave the show a spin-off! And? I'm not trying to be funny here. It is absolutely fucking abysmal! <laughs> You wanna know why exactly the Loud House came tumbling down? It's a story of greed, a story of purely playing it safe. All parts of a master plan. Or, you know, maybe because this show is shit? A few reasons are actually at play here and we'll get into them in a second, but I first want to get some stuff out of the way that some of you may be wondering about. Cartoon She, you said you loved the Loud House and it was one of your favorite Nicktoons. Two years ago. Yes, I am aware I have given the show a tad too much credit, as 2019 was the year I began to view media a lot more critically and my thoughts on The Loud House had not changed at that point. Also, I think you can tell from that video's quality that I was kind of a dipshit. I would like to preface this video with the following for those who are unfamiliar with this channel or me personally. God, I hate my old videos. My thoughts on how I consume media have changed since the far off days of 2019, so spare me some mercy, please. I am also aware that there are some people who defend this show rather religiously and that some people may be upset by this video. So I'd like to take this chance to say that you are not special and I do not give a single fuck about you or your feelings. Enjoy what you want, but acknowledge the flaws if you want an understanding. Challenge them if you feel they're inaccurate. By all means. But if you wish to tell me that in your opinion the show is flawless and that you wish I was dead or that I would stop reviewing things, I will simply laugh at you. You have been a worthless, unspecial child since the day your mother shit you out in a public restroom. Let's get on with the show!
starting off with an explanation because I need to be more aware of the IQ of the people watching my videos. Seasonal rot is a term used to describe an installment in any long running series that is widely held to be of a notably poorer quality than the other installments. Often tied to the dislike of a specific arc, but can also perform episodic shows. In other words, Star Verses. <laughs> Yes, that was a particularly easy target, but you get what I'm saying. Seasonal rot? Yeah, that's right, you deaf cunt. In a shocking turn of events, a modern cartoon from the 2010s that's in its late season begins a sharp decline in quality, or in some cases gets even worse than it originally was. Now, before you type your next paragraph filled without homonyms, because I said Adventure Time has been bad since season 5 again, I mean, just imagine the state Reddit would be in the next time I upload if they didn't rely on them. <laughs> It should be worth noting that this is a Nickelodeon show. There isn't a single Nickelodeon show that hasn't in some way suffered from seasonal rot. Okay, fine. There are only two shows from Nickelodeon that haven't suffered from seasonal rot. So the fact that Loud House has encountered this problem isn't exactly surprising. I mean, getting your artistic vision milked by Nickelodeon anyway is equivalent to a monkey paw. The problem is that for the Loud House, it seemed to happen far too quickly compared to any other show in the network's history. Why is this exactly? Well... Wait, what's that? You thought the creator of a Nickelodeon show wasn't a piece of shit? But in all seriousness, it wasn't just the show's creator getting fired for being too based that ruined the show's quality, although that definitely most likely played a part in it. It's also the quality of the scripts from the current writers. Also, even when Chris Weinstein was on the show, it still didn't stop season 2 from being a gigantic crock of shit. Let's get a few things about The Loud House out of the way. It's not a big, continuity-driven show of continuing plot thread. It is a purely episodic show, and thus I should absolutely criticise it as such. Except for when it isn't, but we're not going to go there. A good place to start would be the episode structure. Because boy, if The Loud House ain't one of the most predictable shows I've ever seen. Now something that initially made The Loud House actually worth watching was its ability to make predictable plots and mundane episode ideas entertaining with its own spin on things. Now control your fucking hormones, you pubic louse. Loud House for sure isn't taking a page from the Ryan Johnson school of subverting expectations. Although on a related note, it does take a page from the Ryan Johnson school of squirting anal fluid on a decent IP, but that's besides the point. What Loud House does do, however, is add little pieces of its own charm, humour, and character chemistry that makes an otherwise done to death concept a welcome and enjoyable surprise, like eating a Kinder Egg in the UK and not being labelled a terrorist. <laughs> This was done in part thanks to the show being about a chaotic family, of the one boy in the middle of it, Lincoln Loud, going about mostly mundane activities in a large family and trying to make sure his sisters don't fuck anything up. And you know, given the fact that this show was created to show Chris Graben's view of living in a big chaotic family, it's not unreasonable to see a bit of him in Lincoln. Lincoln is based. Women aren't funny. This led to many episodes feeling very relatable, and it was also a possible goldmine for some decent comedy. As you can probably tell though, this didn't carry over too well to the later seasons. <laughs> I'm funny. We'll get into the comedy in a second. Now, as you can probably guess from that setup, the structure for a typical Loud House episode is like this. Mundane activity or a relatable family activity presents itself, the Loud family causes chaos, leading to some sort of conflict. Conflict is then resolved in some way. Simple free act structure of an easily replicated formula. Just scour through your memories to the day you got your shit kicked in at school for playing Yu-Gi-Oh on your own because your weak-ass posture is asking for it, and then turn it into a family-friendly episode of a Nickelodeon show. Or alternatively, make an episode of the kid version of you kissing the little sister of your older sister boyfriend because that's not fucked up at all. Maybe there's a reason for the incest obsession after all. Gotcha, bitch. So this structure and formula worked well enough throughout season one, so what went wrong for it to suddenly turn so sour? Well don't worry your pretty little heads, it's only everything. For starters, the show eventually ran out of mundane family activities that were familiar to most people, eventually substituting them for small scale episodes focused on specific characters. Not to flesh them out, although those happen more frequently too, but just for the characters to have self-contained adventures. And these kinda... varied? I I guess, I mean, most of them were shit. The show went from being about what it's like to grow up in a big family to now being an even more generic slice of life show about Lincoln going to school to hang out with his nobody friends and the token black guy that cartoons put into their shows of representation, but subsequently do nothing with them because they just don't care. I use the racism to destroy the racism is a lot more than a meme now. <laughs> well, maybe that's not fair. Clyde gets some attention every now and then, but I want someone to tell me what the fuck his personality is aside from the lovable character trait of being a butt monkey twink who has a bloody nose nosed orgasm when he sees Laurie for half a second. I honestly can't stand how overused the word simp is, and its original meaning is pretty offensive. Oh, no, you SHUT THE FUCK UP! Like, sure, he gained some independence from his parents at one point, but aside from that, he really is just there so Chris Grabham can score some easy brownie points.
Without putting effort into his character. Glad I clarified that last part. Don't know why I did, to be honest. It's not like elaborating matters to people. <laughs> You know, the people who jam one finger up their ass and use the other to mindlessly point at black characters in media and clap as if they're fucking zoo animals who just shit out a clean peanut. Remind me who the racist one is again? Especially when it's clear the company really doesn't care at all. I think not demanding standards for black representation other than the funny friend is a little worse than me pointing it out, but I'm not going to judge. Out loud. Just a reminder that John Boyega deserves so much better. <laughs> Aside from that, the sisters get episodes to themselves too. But, and this is going to be shocking. Don't care. Don't care. Don't care. And neither did the writers. Out of all the ones I've seen, you'd have me stumped trying to find any that were truly exceptional. Although answers may vary depending on what fan of the show you ask. Like, I'll give praise to the show in a second for the episodes where they decide to actually flesh the characters out, but there are so many episodes where it's just one of the loud siblings doing something with no actual substance. It's just uninteresting and not particularly entertaining. Add on self-defeating too, the show is called The Loud House. It's about growing up in a large family and the chaos that ensues, so creating so many of these episodes with the main characters doing things and hanging out with characters we don't know or care about might just be a huge fucking handicap. An element that makes typical Loud House episodes flow well is the show's fast pace. Now, unlike a story-driven show which needs to give you plenty of understandable details about the story at a certain pace to not overwhelm or confuse people. You, yes you, pay attention, you'll be examined on this shortly. The Loud House is a cartoon that solely relies on its speed to work. The first season is full of energy and frenetic action with a really fast soundtrack mostly comprised of rock or any other genre but just sped up so that it matches the scene. I mean the show's theme song is genuinely fantastic and captures the spirit of what the show is supposed to be rather well. <laughs> Loud House just simply works at its best with a fast pace, much akin to another popular cartoon that suffered a similar fate, the Powerpuff Girls. No, my goose. No, not that one. I'm talking the original 90s Powerpuff Girls. This was a fast-paced show that was never written or made in any way that allowed for a slow pace. If the show had a slow pace, hardly any of it would work and it would simply become, well, slow. And downright boring to most. This is exactly what happened towards the end of the show's run, where the episode runtime was extended to 20 minutes from the usual 10 for some ass-backwards reason. For crying out loud, CN, you gave this show 20 minutes, but not Steven Universe. Are you fucking with my soul? Now, this shouldn't be a problem. Problem normally, you can write fast paced episodes for a 20 minute cartoon. It's just that the Powerpuff Girls was never going to work in such a way, which then left us with many notorious scenes like this. <laughs> What was that? No, tell me, what the fuck was that? That was pure unmitigated bum fluff that caused all the impact the joke had to disintegrate. It wasn't a particularly clever joke, but just look at how easily this could have been fixed. <laughs> Was easy. It just became agonizing to watch. Now, what was the point of me talking about the Powerpuff Girls? Well, it's because it's repeated history. The Loud House, as it progressed, lost a lot of its edge. With less focus being put on the family escapades, the show's pacing had to be adjusted to the smaller scale episodes. So the show that was originally the manifestation of corporately disguised cocaine turned into an absolute fucking bore. This isn't to say every episode had a slow pace, but it was definitely extremely noticeable that without the energy of the Louds constantly bouncing off of each other, there was something missing from the show. And this problem is further highlighted largely thanks to the season 3 episode of Fridge Too Far, which harkened way back to the style of the first season being about the louds battling over each other's labelled leftovers in the fridge. <laughs> It's an otherwise mundane episode concept amped up to an absurd level due to the show's frenetic chaos. It comes naturally when the louds are actually fulfilling the purpose of the show. It was also pretty damn funny and it was clear that this is the kind of scenario the show works best with because, oh, I don't know, it's the reason it was made? It's just frustrating because the show can evidently still be good, but it never does. So much of the show's advertising is just center of chaos. There will be chaos, 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 chaos. Everything about this fucking show screams, I'm an agent of chaos. Fuck off. You want to know what you get? when you show that you're capable of bringing your show back to its glory days but fail to see just how different the stuff you continue to do is, you get Voltron Legendary Defender. That's funny, Arthur. That's the kind of humor we do on this show. Yeah, just as funny as Lance's character progression. 
You want to hear another joke about Voltron? No, I think we've had enough of your jokes. Okay, I'm s yeah, I'm sorry. Ma the pacing and structure both work together here along with the loss of the show's identity to create a show that is basically unrecognizable when compared to the first season. What doesn't help is that now, without either of these things as well as the show's originally funny writing gone, the predictability of the episodes becomes unbearable. You can see everything coming from a mile away like George Bush on September 11 and it just makes for one of Nickelodeon's most bland shows. Another thing I should probably add is that the show tended to get a bit carried away when it came to its mean spirits. Oh, such a pretty girl. Disgusting! Now he's some kind of furry. I wish it was that bad because that would be hilarious, but instead the show settles for locking children out of houses. So obviously someone on the writing team has disdain towards their partner for not buying good enough protection. Speaking of the loud house and protection, here's a thumbnail I found. Please seek some help. Okay, so to be honest, Mean Spirit doesn't really do it justice. What I actually mean is that as the show progressed, it suddenly lost control of its basic humanity, leading to episodes like No Such Luck, written by people who most likely gain pleasure by kicking random puppies in the middle of the street. Episodes like No Such Luck are fucking infamous and are one of the only aspects of the show you'll find most Loud House fans absolutely despise. For good reason too, given that whoever wrote it probably tortures pigs on the dark web. Then again, torturing pigs behind closed doors is standard fare in this industry. No, of course not all women are pigs, silly. Not every woman's a celebrity. I mean, maybe brain damage was caused behind closed scenes as well. Maybe that could explain the room temperature IQ takes I keep seeing from these motherfuckers. Like, you deadass know these kids are on that pack. Like, come on. I hit a woman for the first yeah. time in my life. Yeah, right. And I'm having fun. Back to no luck fuck. It's literally child abuse played for a laugh. Like, Chris, my man, I know times were tough or pleasurable, I don't give a fuck, but am I supposed to find this funny? An episode where Lynn loses one game and then begins a downward spiral of ruining Lincoln's life because that's a great character. Like, sure, Lincoln brought it upon himself by using bad luck as an excuse to get out of doing shit, the crafty bugger, but if you think I'm still going to laugh at him being locked out of the house and given breakfast through the fucking cat flap, then I'm going to question why you're so happy laughing at it in the writer's room or sitting on your throne made out of your own shit and piss. And while we're on the topic of casual Hollywood Satanism, I mean mean-spiritedness, it should be worth mentioning that the first season was obviously not immune to some of this. Out on a limo has Lincoln become friends with some fat prick and then suddenly turns into a Tory for the rest of the episode. Which, as you could probably guess, was fun in the same way scrolling through Twitter is stimulating for your brain cells. Or fuck it, life expectancy. But fuck me, did the rest of the seasons go overboard at times? While some of it isn't simply being mean-spirited and is simply one of the characters uncharacteristically acting like a total gibbon for 10 minutes, these character inconsistencies, along with mean-spiritedness, don't give me a very positive view of the show's writer's room. Comparing season 1 to the later seasons is probably not helpful in this regard, as they both have the same fucking problem. It's just that season 1 had considerably less of it. And if we're going to dive deep into character inconsistencies, despite all of the characters getting their fair share of development throughout the show, which I'll get into later, it's retroactively fucking meaningless as they'll be smiling and treating everyone fairly like a saint and then the next day will be conjuring the souls of hell to ravage the nearest sibling because someone ate all the fucking Oreo fins again. There's no point in character development if they're going to then 180 back into being a senseless ninny again after the next 24 hours. I'll go more in depth about that soon, but it is strange how the show is able to make me like and sympathize with a character one episode and then make me pull out a fucking crucifix fix the next time they're on screen. It's like once every season one of the loud siblings gets a chance to be Hitler for an episode, you just have to endure it until they eventually learn their forced lesson towards the end with a stock sad piano track followed by a oh I'm so sorry if only I knew what effect I was having on this current situation I wouldn't have- Fuck off with the Logan Paul apology shit that isn't writing! It's radioactive sewage stained onto a sheet of paper, it isn't compelling! Your show's writing is equivalent to a Volvo XC90, it's fucking lame! It's barely holding itself together. What we can understandably get from this is that the absolute spunk that is this show's handling of heartfelt moments and ending lessons makes for moments where one would dare to facepalm, but that would be giving the show more effort in emoting how bad it is rather than simply talking about it. So here we are. In the future, I'm dead. I get having sibling rivalry, that's a relatable aspect of the show and one that I'm not against in the slightest. It's just when you make a character fucking insufferable towards Lincoln for no clearly justified reason, it doesn't give me much of a reason to care about them once they finally get the development episode. Because I'm not sure about you, but it's not particularly fun watching a character who's already proven himself to being annoying, parasitic little c- the only character who I can think of that works with this is Lola. Not just because she's bratty, but because she's actually funny most of the time. She can be overbearing and sometimes annoying, but I was surprised that the one part of the show that remained consistent throughout the newer seasons was Lola. Unfortunately, despite her working excellently as an antagonist, they still insist on tainting the other characters. So... 
shit. Something you'll notice when it comes to the show's messages and morals is that they're either executed in a way that's heartfelt, this is a good thing, or they're randomly dumped at the end of the episode with a final 30 seconds dedicated to a random fucking apology scene or have morals that are so fucking twisted, the second they try and pass it off as a genuine thing to be teaching children, I end up nearly rolling my eyes hard enough to permanently blind myself for the utter stupidity unfolding before me. This was also a season 1 problem that has sadly gotten even worse with later seasons. Once again, no such luck as the king of animated child abuse. It's like the show's equivalent to Arnold portrays Iggy just without the possible kink baiting for potential pit maps. Save me once again, I thank you. Or then there's prematurely unprocessed excrement like Brawl in the Family that badly executes his message of leaving your siblings to fix their problems and undercuts it at the end by having everyone kick the shit out of each other in a scene uncannily similar to an Irish happy hour, all the while treating Lincoln like complete shit, although he didn't do himself many favours admittedly. Then there's the case where the episode is completely rotten to the fucking core even without its morals like the absolute absolutely god-awful Kings of the Khan, an episode that demonstrates exactly why the show's lack of continuity at points is so detrimental, with the sisters taking no interest in the comic book Lincoln likes at all, despite a previous episode, Pop Friction, literally ending with them meeting the creator of the comic who's looking to make all the siblings characters in the upcoming issue. That episode was good, surprisingly. It actually had a decent and satisfying ending as opposed to the cheap joke cynical bullshit the show pulls out from under the rug nowadays. In Kings of the Khan, they have no fucking interest whatsoever besides fame, and an after 20 minutes of excruciating agony, not too dissimilar to the crippling depression I used to have, the girls get all the fame and get to star in a movie, while Lincoln and Clyde are left in the background to shovel shit, in a not so subtle metaphor of what writing for the Loud House is actually like. I'm not going to rag on the episodes where morals aren't a focus, but for the episodes that have morals as corrupt as the Brazilian police force or are as rotten as Kings of the Con, if you think these subpar mazes of ejaculated STD Tom fuckery that you've gotten the Dark Lord to summon into an actual script are acceptable for children, I think it's about high time you got out the writer's room for some fresh air. Touch some fucking grass for all I care. You're my bitch. I feel like I'm watching a family member slowly die of Alzheimer's due to the fact that thanks to the previous four seasons, the show's foundation now has more holes than John Lennon's corpse. When making a children's show that aims to have episodes where lessons are taught, you better be damn sure you teach them properly or actually teach a good moral because one awful season is enough to breed a generation of sociopaths. I've made a severe- Okay, that's a massive overreaction for comedy's sake. We just don't need another one. No. Just stop with this dark-hearted- I'm running out of synonyms for shit here. Yeah. Not every kid show needs to have good morals, that is completely retarded. I don't remember being taught about the dangers of climate change by Wile E. Coyote when I was five, or the uprising of the Third Reich by Walt Disney when I was seven. Oh wait, never mind. But Loud House is clearly aiming to do this with certain episodes, so it's worth mentioning. I also just want to call out the Lincoln torture porn, because despite him being a total jerkass at times, this motherfucker it's never pleasant to watch, unless it's rightfully deserved, like with Out on the Limo. <laughs> Fucking Tory. But that's not all. Let's finally talk about the big inflated Luan in the room. <laughs> is the Loud House funny? The answer is yes and no. That is not funny. Now, I'm not gonna act like the Loud House season one was the holy messiah of comedy. It wasn't. But it had more effort placed into its writing than whatever the hell. <laughs> I mean, if Loud House's first season wasn't funny whatsoever, then we wouldn't have this masterpiece of a line. You know, I'm noticing a complete lack of balls in this room. Obviously, I'm not the best person to listen to when it comes to comedy, but it's a purely subjective thing, and I'm about as funny as a helicopter crash. There was supposed to be a helicopter visual here, I swear I had that downloaded somewhere. Wait, what is that noise? Oh my god, oh shit! But something I can criticize is the type of comedy the show does and how it presents it. Season 1 of The Loud House had a decent balance of slapstick so the little kiddie winks don't ask their parents to switch the channel, along with well-written humor so that the parents don't think about why they should have pulled out six years ago. This is something plenty of shows do in order to appeal to the whole family. However, there is a single problem that often- <laughs> Season 1 had its toilet humour and gross out humour at times, but it never really defined the show's comedy. However, it was a problem that would only get worse as the show went on, as it went from being a show that anyone of any age could enjoy into being strictly for children. Which, when you look at its fan base, I'd say that's fairly accurate. You're a fucking sicko, and I'm surprised your parents actually even raised you. Now, in case you were wondering, no, I am not brain damaged, and second of all, despite this man's looks, he is mentally a child. As you could probably tell from his imperfect facial structure, I don't think he actually finished breastfeeding yet. I'd call him an actual child or a man-child if I could, but I think he's probably a danger to both. Just had to do, like, a little talk on this adorable episode, because it has all boys in it, plus his I'm into guys. You know, why not? Not to mention, they can, they can call it adorable in the listener undies. Stop the cap! <laughs> Stop the cap right now!
A children's story that can only be enjoyed by children is not a good children's story in the slightest. And if you sideline your originally funny and well-written writing for something like this, I'm just going to assume you stop trying. Now that might be a little harsh, but I personally think it would be ruder of me to say that they were trying, because if that's the case, then... That's embarrassing. You get nothing! Focusing more and more on toilet and gross out humor is going to alienate a lot of people to say the least. It is perhaps the lowest form of humor. Wouldn't have a problem if this was how the show started out, but... <laughs> Well, I guess money truly does change people. Or in this case, no one was changed, it just took them a while to catch on. It's about money. Huh? Okay, one thing about the show that I'll give some honest to god praise for is that at the tail end of season 1 and going into season 2, it began to start fleshing out its characters. Now truthfully, I don't hate a single character in The Loud House. <laughs> That's not a character. You lose! But these episodes did certainly give them a few more layers, ha <laughs> ha! Specifically, my favourite character is Luna, because they've given her the most attention out of every character, even back in the show's first season, so it's a little unfair, but whatever. Even characters who were originally very one-note got their fair share of development. For example, Luann was probably the most one-note character on the show. She told shitty jokes and pranked people, that's literally all there was to her. She had the collective character depth of a limp teaspoon and was extremely flat, and not just because she's 14, you sick fucks. This lasted for a while until we eventually got a few episodes to show a few more sides to her that made lots of people that were originally quite harsh towards how she was written warm up to her. Her insecurities when it comes to criticism, her jealousy when other people achieve success in a shorter time span than she has. These are things a lot of people can genuinely relate to and it's why even though this development doesn't actually carry much of an impact in later episodes, Luan remains one of my favourite characters on the show. But that's just it you see. The development is in retrospect kinda fucking pointless. Like don't get me wrong, I'm happy it's there. It's something many episodic shows don't bother with. My problem stems from the fact that even though we understand the characters a bit more, the development is pretty much completely fucking forgotten about until the next random episode in which their character is explored. Like, I'm not the only one who is kind of pissed that Luan has an episode at the end of season 2 where she learns to respect her siblings' limits when it comes to her shenanigans, and then at the start of the next bloody season we get the 3rd April Fool's Day episode where she goes absolutely fucking feral and ruins her entire family's reputation with stunt doubles because who der funny? No! It's not funny, you are a c- who is the flamboyant pillar who looked at that and went, yeah, that's fine, that's a good job, like, no, no, it isn't a good job, Sammy, you done fucked it up. Uh, back on topic. I don't really understand why we're supposed to care about these characters developing when their development has little to no bearing on anything. Like, sure, Lynn gets some development, she got bullied at school, had a little cry, boo-hoo, it doesn't excuse her acting like a complete cock. And before you ask why I have such a deep-rooted hatred for this character, well, don't take my word for it, take the character's own words for it. For it, as well as her actions, because my lord. <laughs> It doesn't matter if a character is given a really good arc in one episode, that progress is completely sidelined as a result of the show being episodic, so why bother? This also ties into my previous point on how the show started to focus more and more on character focused episodes. Now don't piss and shit and call your moms yet, this is not me contradicting myself. Because a lot of people seem to think that just having an episode of one character that isn't Lincoln being the main focus means the episode contains character development. And it's a point used by plenty of people who defend the show to overhype how good it is. In season 2, the number of episodes not focused on Lincoln began to increase. We started getting adventures from all the loud siblings' perspectives. Now believe it or not, I'm not fully against this idea. So long as it doesn't overtake the number of episodes about, you know, the loud house, then I'm finding for them taking a break every once in a while, but I'm pretty sure we all know right now that they decided to take the show in a new direction. Well, it couldn't be that bad. I'm sure there are plenty of people who liked and wanted these to happen. Who asked for an episode where Luann, Luna, and Laurie campaigned to get their school clubs back? Thought so. These episodes just aren't interesting or remotely compelling enough to be worth watching, they just take up space. And given how many of these there are, it's a wonder why the fuck they haven't gone back to doing episodes in the Loud House because that worked and flowed infinitely better than the 600th episode about a retarded misunderstanding that at one point involves an unfunny, morbidly obese curmudgeon whose mere presence in the plot synopsis killed 75% of my total happiness for the day, and whose mannerisms combined with his voice make me want to massacre a herd of gorillas. Who even voices him exactly? Oh come on! 
on Bender. That makes me very sad. You see, Bender is actually funny. Flip is just on a whole nother level of regurgitated stomach acid. Every time he's on screen, I feel another part of my empty soul leave my body. And unfortunately, he represents the worst traits of any side character on the show. Oh yeah, there are other side characters besides Flip. Can you remember them? All of these problems combined turned what was once a relatively entertaining show into one of the most painfully unoriginal and bland things I've ever seen come out of Nickelodeon. It's not on the same level of terrible or something like pig go for pig pig go banana banana what the fuck fuck pig go banana what? Why is that fucking thing? But it no longer does anything to stick out and good episodes are few and far between. What about seasons four and five? No! This is where the quality of the show really started to tank. Kicking off season 4 of a whopping 9 episodes dedicated to advertising the dying network money making scheme. The creatively saturated and highly anticipated spin off to The Loud House. The Loud House escaped to Mexico. Oh, look at my huh, seems I was right. Obama was the avatar of animation. Then again, we didn't get any Muslim representation whilst Barry was drone striking defenseless children. Boss Barack was doing his best to stop the rampant terrorism going on in the Middle East. These nine episodes were then followed by more brainless bullshit. And because IMDb has little to no quality control, you'd almost be tricked into thinking each episode of this season was some kind of Hitchcock level or tier theory masterpiece. Here's an episode where the louds are envisioned as a more idealistic family just for their parents' benefits. Wait a second, didn't we already do something similar to this like two seasons ago? Keep that thong up your ass, Johnson, we're coming in hot for fucking 9.7 rating. <laughs> Here's a list of movies and TV shows rated lower than this one episode that are much more worth your time than this soulless piece of retreaded condom spaff. There is an average of around 30 people actively rating every episode of The Loud House, with around 60% of ratings always being a perfect 10. This piece of ass. And you thought you were given too much credit. And your upholstery. <laughs> Season 5 gets even worse, kicking off with an episode so bad that despite the relatively high IMDb rating, I actually saw quite a few people complaining about how the whole thing just scripts the bottom of the barrel in terms of Canada jokes. America Junior. And having Lincoln get banished from Canada for not liking maple syrup. Someone wrote that joke and was really proud of themselves. And by the way, this episode ran for an hour. Yes, a full fucking hour of stale Canada jokes, <laughs> fucking god. This show is so well fucking written. I've managed to make it to about episode 14 in season 5, as that's the latest episode as of writing this video, but honestly, I think I've seen enough. Having sat through four seasons of some of the worst writing I've seen come out of Nickelodeon in years, The Loud House is simply a show in the middle of an identity crisis. And because of this identity crisis, it's not nearly as good as it originally was. Again, not to suck the first season's dick too much, but you could understand why people were fans of this show. It was simple, but that's what was so likeable about it. It didn't complicate shit of experimental episode ideas. And while it's always good to step out of your comfort zone to see what works, when it clearly isn't working as well as what you did previously, then I think it might just be because you created your show around a very specific concept and it just doesn't work in any other setting. And it is a shame because I like these characters. I like 10 of these characters. And it's not like we've only gotten terrible stuff. There have been genuinely fantastic episodes, even if they don't harken back to the show's original antics. Tricked, really loud music, headphones anxiety, a fridge too far. These three are some of the show's best episodes and they all came from season three. There is legitimate writing talent present in the writer's room for this show, yet it barely gets a chance to truly shine. It makes for a very frustrating viewing experience and one with a very inconsistent quality. And if there's one thing I hate above all else, it's inconsistency. Yes, I know it's ironic. Ah yes, the show has gay characters. I don't care. The difference between The Loud House and something like The Owl House is that in The Loud House there's no story driven plot to completely butcher the pacing off for the sake of having explicit queer representation. Lumity just didn't feel like an organic relationship to me, and it certainly didn't progress like one objectively either. In The Loud House however, gay characters are actually treated with a little more actual respect as opposed to putting them on a pedestal and sacrificing the believability of the characters and world just to make headlines in their first season. Now don't get me wrong, Loud House made plenty of headlines with its gay rep, less just how the media works, but it wasn't actively aiming to make their gay rep a massive thing. Clyde having two dads is just shown as normal and doesn't seem to be forcing any kind of agenda other than basic human respect. This is representation I am fucking down for. And even though the reveal that Luna had a crush on Sam was kinda on the nose, it's still treated as a normal healthy relationship. And I feel as if I must make this clear for a second because some people seem to get the wrong idea of me because of how much I meme on progressive programming, I am not against representation. 
It's just that the majority of it is really, really shit. So yeah, good job, Loud House. You did something right. For once. The unspoken rule that most people know of when it comes to Nickelodeon is that the second they smell the tiniest hint of success, they will milk the show in question until it's sucked dry at an Epstein after a visit to his island. Any other show that doesn't meet the give a shit requirement set by Spongebob ratings will be slowly poisoned or in some cases quickly murdered on the spot. As much as I hate the legend of Korra for how much it breaks the world of Avatar and the fact that it's filled with more holes than XSX Tentacion's corpse, I will run that joke far into the ground until it stops making me giggle like a spastic for five hours. Even I'll admit that Nick did the show a little little dirty. Although after season 2 outclass itself in sheer fucking stupidity, I don't think I would have liked to see it on TV either. They are still doing this to this day. Only a few years ago, unfairly smiting Harvey Beaks down over to Nicktoons to die a slow and painful death, along with holding the show's creator at gunpoint until he gave a public apology, after he called them out in the show's treatment because that's great PR, and more recently completely cutting glitch text from premiering on television and putting it on Netflix with barely any hyper-promotion at all, aside from a few trailers that barely got any attention, while also putting its second season on there the same day as The Legend of Korra, which they knew was going to be a massive success after reeling in a bunch of new Last Airbender fans only a few months prior, leading to the show being completely overshadowed and now it's effectively cancelled. That's great, thank you so much Nickelodeon you money grubbing monkey cunts. And if you're looking to make a show and honestly want to tell me that you're comfortable with making a cartoon for Nickelodeon then there's really only one life path open for you pal. But let's go back a bit to the absolutely brain dead hype this show was given when it released, to when this show was going to save Nickelodeon. That aged well. You fool! When Nickelodeon started giving the show more attention after it successfully toppled SpongeBob and ratings, a lot of people were hopeful that they had learned from their previous mistakes and that this show would usher in a new era. Obviously, we know this did not happen because if you ever expect a corporation to change for the better, then you're probably either still an infant or have the brain capacity of a plastic fork. But given all of that, what does Loud House's current treatment as Nickelodeon's cash cow mean? from the network. Well, this still means that their schedule is going to be the absolute worst, and it also means that this newfound success given to the show by the level of overhype it received four years ago as, uh, well, let's just put it lightly. You were the chosen one. It has ironically created the very thing the people hyping the show up feared in the first place, not just a direct competitor to Spongebob, but an interchangeable replica. If the show was still good, and I wouldn't mind this as much, but as evidence, the level of quality control at Nickelodeon is quite embarrassing. And given the fact that the show is still popular, and also still has people overhyping it online, I don't see this ending anytime soon. I mean, to be honest, it was always fated to be this way. I mean, the logo and the main character are fucking orange. I'd say that's enough for the show to become the poster child for the network. I mean, I knew something was up the second they made a tap and wait mobile game of microtransactions. Even if their attempt at stealing money off of children didn't go too well for them, there's always the next business decision. I don't see any way this could go terribly wrong. I mean, it is a new direction to take the show after all, we all know how well that goes. The adventure follows the Loud family to Scotland where they discover that they are descendants of Scottish royalty. Wait, hold on! Keeping in line with the show's string of quality, it appears that this is a new direction. I just didn't expect it to be a new direction into a brick wall. Now, as much as I've ragged on this on Twitter, there's a possibility that this movie could be somewhat good. <laughs> Nah, sorry, the Loud House can barely keep a consistent narrative together over 11 minutes, much less over an hour. Fuck that nonsense. Of course, the second the show gets a feature-length, higher-budget movie to explore places the show has never gone before, or even touched before, they go with the secret lineage slash royalty trope. I am so glad. The show has officially reached a point where it's now consistent in its inconsistency. We frequently refer to this as the Sword Art Online Paradox. How about another? <laughs> Look, by all accounts, they could grab some insanely talented guy to make it work, but my point is that the odds are just a tad too low. And really, it was the movie announcement that kind of pressured me into finally updating my thoughts on the show and my brief thoughts on how Nickelodeon treats it. This show has received a lot of criticism from stable to not so stable, but this criticism tends to get brushed off by Loud House fans who seem to act like the tiniest hint of merit is worthy of all the praise in the world. You can't just say the show is bland and uninteresting, this character had about five seconds of emotion aside from being a dipshit, so the show is basically a participation trophy for bad writers.
Well, I take it all back. That's perfect for the 21st century. Bring them all here. Back on topic, the Loud House is definitely going to have a negative influence on Nickelodeon. Well, it currently is. <laughs> Nothing has changed of its existence. Nick are still the scum cuts of the animation scene. Passion for good storytelling isn't their forte when they can simply print money with two shows. Anything remotely equality gets thrown under the bus without a second thought. Nickelodeon is corporate evil, just like the rest of them. But there's something specific about Nick's treatment of shows that overall just disgusts me. How Avatar the Last Airbender was able to even run for three seasons and be successful is a mystery in all honesty. To end off my brief thoughts on the show's treatment, I'll ask you guys a question. Do you think there's a possibility that Nickelodeon could change someday? I'd love to hear what you have to say if you bother with this. Closing time Open all the doors and Well, this was something I've been waiting to get off my chest for a while, despite how easy of a target this was. This is low even for you! Even then, I hope some of you can understand why this show is so bad. If not, then... Fine, I don't care. I'm not saying you can't like it, of course, as opposed to what some people like to say. It is a shame, though. This was a show that originally had a lot of talent behind it, and to some extent, that talent is still there. I just don't think it's being properly utilized because they're trying to do things with a show that it was obviously not designed to work with. In the end, we were all fools, deceived by a man's reputation and career, despite the fact that he was a Nickelodeon showrunner, so something had to be up behind the scenes. And the people following the hype of YouTubers without thinking for themselves made the problem exponentially worse. You can probably tell that this video isn't my most sophisticated or f fuck it. I guess it's not really filled with much content. That kind of explains just how much I have to say about the show because it really can just be summarized to a few key points. I guess I do better when there are more things to rip into to explain why something is bad, but for the Loud House there really isn't much to explain. Its flaws are in plain sight. If there's anything you can take away from this video other than left baiting, it's probably that you should always form your own conclusions. Hollywood is on the decline and don't take corporations for granted. And if you're a child and have stumbled across this video, pick a decent career path, like engineering or something, and keep up with your studies, because going into acting is a slippery slope to great success at the cost of your innocence. Like a lamb to the slaughter. Fuck it. Let's go!